Hi, and welcome to Tabletop Spotlight, a show within a show on Tabletop Babble. I'm Amber, she, her pronouns, and with me today I have... Kenny, that's me, hello. Uh, yes, the other co-host of Tabletop Babble. The other, other the co-host. Other, oh yeah, I'm sorry, the other, other co-host. Um, so yeah, so Tabletop Spotlight, what is it? Everyone wants to know. Yes. Um, well, it's a new thing that I'm doing to help break up the interviews. We talk a lot of, with game designers and other people in the TTRPG space, and I kind of wanted to add some variety to the show. And I think, I'm not exactly sure how or when I decided to do this show specifically, um, but it all centers around the fact that I own a lot of RPG books that I have not gotten a chance to read yet. And I was looking for some reason to do that other than putting together a game, right? Which I feel like yeah. a lot of people, the only reason why you end up reading a game book is if you're going to actually go to play it. Um, which, I mean, at least I, it's been my case. I feel like you own way, way more role-playing games than I do. And I still have ones that I have not read like and have not got to. The Burning Wheel? Yes, that's a fantastic example <laughs> of a tome that I have not yet found the energy to get all the way through. Right. And I feel like there are a lot of people who experience the similar situation that we're in, right? You The game comes out, it's super cool, but you don't get a chance to read it or go through it. And But also at the same time, I know that this is a personal passion project for me. Like the reason I'm doing this is because I like organizing information and I like going through stuff. So welcome to Tabletop Spotlight, a way for me to do my day job, but in games. <laughs> but also I, the thing I like about it is that I am definitely a person. I, so many games come out and I want to know what they're about, but I don't, I don't have the brain space. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. And so I thought what, what if somebody else did it? And then it's like, what if we did it? Yes, exactly. Because we, like, we, <laughs> Kenny and I both watch tons and tons of like movie reviews. It's a big thing, or TV show reviews. And so, yeah, we we just let's just do it ourselves. Um, I'm a instruction manual writer by day. Um, Kenny is a professor. So that's true. Let's do this thing. So the first game which you can the viewer can already see if you're watching this uh it is quest which is a game that i picked up a while ago um, but has been sitting on my shelf but before we get into quest i want to talk a little bit about what this show structure is is going to be like um so let's go look at that speaking of organization yeah speaking of organization like there's no way i'm gonna do this show without some sort of structure to it um, gotta adjust my mic here. Whoops. Um, so anyway, so, so the show structure, we're going to do the game introduction, which I jumped the gun and started to do anyway, but that's fine. It's fine. Uh, our first impressions, just our initial impressions of the book. Uh, in a nutshell. Yeah, basically in a nutshell. Um, our game, the, the actual game overview. So I'm always interested in like, what is, what is this game, right? Like, how do you play this game? Uh, we actually going to do character creation. Ooh, fun. Exciting. Very exciting. I'm very excited about character creation. Um, <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> and then there's always the game master section of a book too. And I think that's important to uh, talk about and review because like, usually there's tools in it or some like good advice or something. And I think it's it's good to touch on that as well. And then I have a user experience background and I do layout design and Kenny also, I, I guess you do it too, to a certain degree. Yeah. I don't have the training, but I have just the experience and it's something I'm interested in right. anyway. Right. Okay. So let's just go right to, to what the show is. So Quest is an RPG. Uh, it's created by TC Sotic, I believe. I'm sorry if I have said your last name wrong. Um, and it's published by the Adventure Guild. I I think one of the things about Quest is the beautiful artwork, so I wanted to call out the art is by Grim Wilkins, Mariana Learmouth, Kevin Sotek, uh, Sotek, 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 I'm so sorry, Sotek? How would you pronounce that, Kenny? Sotek. Sotek? Sotek. The editor was Clis, uh, 
editor was Chris Plant, and then copy editing was done by Kara uh, Verlaney. I also was trying to find um, the graphic designer or layout designer in the the uh, book, but I, that that was not called out because I think. I mean, we'll just talk about. It. Let's just get into our first impressions because I'm about ready to jump in. But I'm gonna let Kenny go first since I, I brought you along for this quest journey. On this quest, well, yeah, I think you were mentioning just the the look of it, and on that previous slide, you saw just the the spread of the book cover, some of the cards, like it's it's gorgeous. Um, I guess for me, I, I have a very personal take on this particular role playing game. Because I've played high fantasy art role playing games are my jam. Like that's where I started. I still love it. I like doing other things too, but that's really where my heart is. And I've always wanted to make a kind of streamlined, simplified role playing game that was high fantasy. Um, and that it's easy to play. It's flexible. It's easy to adapt. It's easy to write for. And my overall impression is after getting through quest, is that I no longer need to make that project. That burden has been lifted off of me. And this is what I had in my brain. I don't know that I could have made it, but this is what I would be aiming for right. if I were going to embark on that Right, because that was a sort of like modified Powered by the Apocalypse game that, I, okay, that you were originally doing, yeah. Yes, that, that was the original. Um, and I mean, this one, I, mean, I think this tops what I would have done myself. True. Um, I and the reason I wanted to do that project is I love all the trappings of high fantasy, but it, it so often these high fantasy role playing games just get bogged down in just all kinds of things, mechanical things, um, just hangers on from the original games in the genre, and it's nice to let loose some of those things for me personally. Sure. So. My first impressions were it's beautiful. Like I got the, um, I'll show it. I got the like limited edition version. So it's like the hardback uh, one that is very, uh, yeah. It's like a Bible. It's, yeah, it does look, it does look like a Bible. Even it's got the purple like ribbon in the middle. Book marker. Book marker, yeah. yeah. Um, it's beautiful. I thought it was just a wonderfully thought out book overall. Um, I love the layout of books. Like, I think the table of contents was like the first thing that I looked at and it was just like so easy and to understand. Um, so yeah, the structure, the information hierarchy, the layout choices, um, especially of like very, very large font, um, mm -hmm. sections that are broken out into spreads, uh, that, so that's basically two pages facing together. So information is on the two pages facing each other or on, or, you know, that information is related to each other. Um, the art, the tone, the writing, it was all just a very like welcoming experience. Like it didn't feel overwhelming at all. Um, very inviting. Um, you know, at first I looked at it and when I first looked at this book, like the first time when I first bought it, I went through maybe the first 20 or so pages and it felt just like a very narrative focused game, which it is a very narrative focused game. I didn't know more about the mechanics, but as you go on, there is some thing there. You know, some some games are very much a, like, just give and take. You're just talking back and collaborative forth. Storytelling. Collaborative storytelling. Collaborative storytelling. Maybe there's tokens exchange or something else. But there is more to this game than, than, uh, that, than that. Um, so, yeah. So, that was my first impressions. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go into the actual, you know, the game and uh overview so uh right off the back there's always a chapter that's like you know getting started and so one of the things i talk about is that there is a gm they call it the the guide they say that it's best for four to six players and that you can run it as a one shot or as a campaign because that was one of my first questions is are you able to advance in this game um but and you are yeah and you are but also a big thing that I always want to know, this is my personal preference. I always want to know what is that core mechanic? Am I going to be tearing a card or cutting out shapes from a piece of paper? Is it going to be lighting done? fires? Yeah, yeah. What am I going to be doing? Um, and in this game, you're going to be rolling um, a D20. This is, that is the only dice. That is the only die that you will need as a D20 to play this game. 
And um, it's it feels like powered by the apocalypse where it's like there's a, a scale, right, of ex- a scale of success on what you roll. So, of course, one is a catastrophe. Two to five is a failure. Six to ten is a tough choice. Eleven to nineteen is a success. And then a nat 20 is going to be a triumph. And you could, well, we'll get into it later, but nat 20 is is probably going to be the only kind of 20s you see. Um, yes. I see a note from you on here. It says, this D20 system is my jam. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this and I was just like, mwah, 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 yum, 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 yum. So good. Because, yeah, it does have the Powered by the Apocalypse feel of it has this. Really, the meat of this role is 2 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 19. Failure, tough choice, success. That's like exactly follows the formula of Powered by the Apocalypse. Just with the extra wrinkles of critical fails and critical successes, catastrophes and triumphs which is just a fun little bit of spice and just the simplicity of it. I love as a GM, I don't have to be thinking about probability curves and things because it's a D 20. You don't have to worry about that. A seven is more likely than a five or anything like that. It's just very simplified, very streamlined. Yep. And it's the only dice you need. I think that's beautiful. Very. Yeah. I, I like it too. I like it a lot. So then going into, to how to play, um, it always, you know, I, I talk about it before where it's always funny to me. There is a section in every book, or at least now, there is a section where basically it's saying, hey, you play this game because it's a conversation between the guide and the players. You say it, you do it, and then you may have to roll. There are scenes, action scenes, and there's rounds in these action scenes and stuff where you get to talk, describe, you do basic attacks, and you have your special abilities. Um, so going from there... Um, and I'm going to probably go this, through this pretty quick. I don't want this to take too much time. There are- Especially because a lot of stuff like this is stuff, like you said, is going to be fairly standard stuff you've seen a bunch. Sure, sure. But that's a th- I think that's another thing. It's going to a sidebar. I think that's another thing that's nice about this is like they lay it out in a way where even if you don't have this like reference knowledge, it's very friendly for new players. Very. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a good foundational RPG. But anyway. And, and if you know these tropes, it's easy to just... <laughs> sure, like flip through it. So hit points are a thing. You begin with 10 HP, and that's all you will have. Uh, damage, uh, your basic unarmed attacks deal one damage. Uh, common weapons deal like two damage. And they kind of talk to you about how you can kind of scale that. Like they gave an example, like maybe Dragon's Breath is six damage. But you mostly will be determining that as the guide. Um, recovery for your HP is you can regroup, which is just a short period of like a short rest. You know, um, mm-hmm. you get halfway point to your maximum hit points, and then you can do a rest, and then you recover all of your hit points after a long rest. Um, death can happen, but I like how they're like you can't seriously get hurt until you run out of hit points. But, like, when you get to zero, you're at death's door, and you can't go below zero uh, unless you get hit. So if you get hit at zero HP, you roll a die, and if the result or equal is... uh, If the result is equal to or less than the hit, your character dies. So there is no going below zero, really. It's just you're at zero. If you take a hit, you could die from it. I think... This everything in this game feels fairly intuitive to me. I would say death is probably the one thing that does not feel intuitive. I don't think it's intuitive. You drop to zero health points and you can still just kind of cruise around. There's no real detriment other than you're vulnerable to serious injury. And we read through this book, but I got to tell you guys from a user experience, knowing how people's brains work, I probably did not read, read deep into it so i'm just gonna let that stand i don't know if there's a section where i just missed it i didn't mark it down and i could go back later and look but they don't talk about injury really like what that means to your character do you remember anything about injury no um and it's again to compare it to some other games in the same vein like powered by the apocalypse there are usually sections telling you that like an injury has a narrative consequence yes this doesn't even really tell you that no or anything so i think that is an interesting way i i i think it kind of goes in line with others the way they've designed other things which we can get into in a minute and i'll I'll talk about that in a minute so i did have i did have one other comment on death 
Um, my the note I took was, dang, very forgiving death system right. in this game. Because when you roll the die, if I'm remembering right, you roll the d20, that's the only dice there is, mm-hmm. when you take damage at zero, and you die if you roll a one or a two, I think. Oh. I can, I can double check that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure because if you, re- the if the result is equal to or less than the hit, your character dies. Right. So yes, if, right. if they're hit for four damage... Right. And then you roll, and then you roll four, three, two, or one, you die. So right. you have to roll above a four in order to, to live. Right. So it, it's it's fairly forgiving, I would say. I, I would Which say is, that too. It's not a knock on it. No. That's more of a, a your personal taste thing. Like how it, it would you'd have to make modifications if you were into a more lethal, more deadly game, sure, I think. For sure. Or you would have monsters just running around doing a lot of damage, I guess. Yeah. Just a anyway. just a raid of goblins just hacking for two damage. Eventually, one of those goblins is going to do it. Right. right. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, we'll move on to that there are special abilities. Uh once you be- get, make your character and you don a role, you get to choose six special abilities that are unique to that role. Adventure points are the way that you do your do abilities. Um, and so you have to require you have to spend those and you start out with 10. And then in order to grow in your abilities and adventure points, basically it's like they said it after every session and they said about a three ish hours is a session in, in the book, you gain five adventure points, but also during gameplay, the guide can reward, uh, adventure points, uh, for like excellent role playing, or you did something really cool or you made up something, you know, amazing. Um, so the guide can give out adventure points. Or you found a treasure. Yes. Um, solved a puzzle. Um, then for abilities, also after every three-ish hour session, players gain one new ability, um, in their role. Uh, and this is kind of, the next section is why I think the death kind of is in line is because when it comes to items and buying stuff, there's no money in quest. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I I liked this too. And I I think it's because... (laughs) They don't want you to get bogged down in the uh, minutia of record keeping or inventory or having to do lots of shopping stuff, which can, Absolutely. for some people, that's fun. I enjoy doing it. And I have players who like going shopping. There's games for that, but that is not Quest. Yes. I would say, um, for me, this is exactly what I want. My first serious role playing game, I started my senior year in college. And our first like session zero essentially, our GM was like, Okay, so you're entering this vast city, you're starting up your business. Do you want to keep track of like your meals and your room and board and the, the money that it'll take? And we're all just like, No, we don't want that. Right. Um, and this really uh takes that to a a, a pretty nice place, I think. Yep. Where it's hand waving most of it, but not money, but getting items and and goods still does kind of matter it's the right balance between simulation and abstraction for me though i think if your gm really is the minutia and the nitty-gritty and tracking all those things this is not the no game they for won't you. be playing quest no no um i i like it i liked i remember and i think one of my post-it notes i said dang utopia uh because you get or just like oh <laughs> the society we live in uh, it's, it's the federation <laughs> yeah it's like you can get m- most of or all of your basic needs taken care of in most places like you can just get food um only items carry value and that's and i'm I'm assuming also your time and like your expertise could also be considered that but it's all barter based it's all trading um so i'm assuming you know if you're if you're playing this game you're going to be finding items or trading time and effort and energy or you know doing things for people or yeah or finding stuff um and which is exciting for me because i think that's more fun in general very definitely and it makes you think more about the value i love the idea that when you find treasure in addition to just this awesome item that might be cool you're thinking what can i get for this what is this worth and you and the the guide can be having a conversation about what that 
what they're willing to give up. Right, exactly. And that's fun. That is fun, especially from an NPC perspective where it's haggling. Like, oh yeah, I love it. I've done that in in, in some of my campaigns. And it's super fun, especially because like I like it when I get to be an NPC who obviously puts heavy emphasis on certain things. Like they want exactly for whatever. It's yeah. just fun to do. It's a fun mini game for your players to figure out what does this person want. Yep. Yep. So then speaking of items and and things, you only can carry 12 things total. Um, they go into detail of what that means. Like, you know, you can't, if you have 12 acorns, that's not all your, that's not 12 things. Those are huge right. ass acorns. You, you have a bag of acorns. You have a bag of acorns. That's your one thing. Um, and so they talk a little bit about that. They talk a little bit about that. And I think that also is part of, you know, going back to their, their 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 death mechanic and their HP mechanic and damage, it's just streamlined. You don't worry about encumbrance. You don't have to because you get 12. Also, if you're traveling, I, why are you carrying more than, you know, unless, <laughs> again, a, the a game where you have pack, animal, pack animals and stuff like that, you know, sure. whatever. Well, I, I like the idea that this game, and this is why I like this balance. This game is saying, Okay, don't sweat the minutia of tracking how much each thing weighs and how much you can carry. But it's not completely saying carry as much as you want. You do still have to think about what things do I want to carry. Yeah. And that's the sweet spot for me. Yes. Like, gosh, I, I'm thinking about my D&D 3.5 days. Sorry, I'm getting caught up in memories of me. Like, why did I even keep this ring for so long? Why do I even? Okay, anyway, we're going to move on yeah um before we get into character creation i want to talk a little bit about the world setting so in the actual book order um the world setting is put in the ability section which i think if this is my one like little nag i think personally i would want this prior to character creation so i would know kind of what my character is going to be but i also understand why they put it there because that's when you're starting to make your character so it makes sense to do it it's it's just like one page. It's a little, it's such a minor nitpick. It doesn't it's matter. Nitpick, it yeah. doesn't even matter. It's fine where it's at. But the world setting. So I really like their visuals in the book. It has really great art. Um, this is talking about it's set in an om, uh, omniverse. So you'll be playing in a worldly plane of something that exists in a huge universe. Um, a sea of universes. And they did it. They said, like, imagine. Uh, lily pads spread across an endless lake i love that imagery it's really good um and then the universe of your story is on one of those lily pads um so it's very open i i love that because i i personally tend to like making my own world and setting versus using the setting of a book that's just an amber uh personal preference um, so I think they do a really good job of setting that up for the, uh, for the, the players and the guide, whoever's going to be running this game. Sure. Any thoughts on it? Could be a little bit of a downside if you, if you prefer to have a world to grasp onto from the beginning, sure. but honestly you can read, like pick any fun fictional world that you are interested in and it's, oh, yeah. it's plug and play. Like yeah. it's so easy to adapt this, which is one of the things I like about it. Yep. Definitely. I was definitely reading this and just still like I was like doing the uh, the Jack Nicholson like vigorous nod as I was reading this sure. like yes this is my, my jam gotcha interconnected dimensions the shadow world the beyond where it's just the source of magic is just the connective tissue between all these universes Ooh. it would be really easy to do a match with a gathering setting oh yeah it's oh. it it writes itself yes this would be perfect okay so now we know the world we know kind of the basics of how to play it's time to make some characters oh yeah characters <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um so character creation is really really simple it's a delight it is an absolute delight you're gonna choose a role there's fighter invoker ranger naturalist doctor spy magician wizard role is basically the character class enter the scene so they basically are saying this is what you look like how you are perceived when you come into a room then you're going to talk about your style what you wear and how you move 
where you call home, uh, where you're from, where your people are known for, what do you believe in, an ideal that guides your behavior, uh, what is your vulnerability, a flaw to make your character complicated and believable, what is a dream of your character, the big dream, the, the reason that fuels their desire for adventure, and then you get to gear up and choose any three common weapons and choose one useful item. Super and for each of these, simple. they give you lots of examples that you can just pick up and use. Yes. So here's what the character sheet looks like. Oh, could I oh, mention something? Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. You can, you can stay on that yeah, page. So, yeah. But um, I just love in this game in general, like you said, it's super easy. There are no stats. There are, are no modifiers. I I could not be more in love. I love just ditching all of that encumbrance. And I also really appreciate in this game how they just totally sidestep the issue of like race in role-playing games by just saying, tell me what your character looks like and then tell me about your people. Right. They don't have to give you any of that stuff, which I think is just great. Yes, I, I, it's wonderful. It's a nice departure from, from other stuff. Um, so yes, the, this character sheet is my jam. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's exactly what you need. I love it. It's super minimalist. It's easy to read. Look at, it's, look at all that white space. Oh, I, love, I love that white space. <laughs> um, I am a fan of of less is more, and this is definitely it. Um, I would feel great about giving this to a friend of mine who's never played a role yes, playing game I, before. I agree. It's a Mad Lib, and like Kenny said, um, in the in the book, there's several pages. Uh, for basically a page for each you know section question right? each there. question right like one is its own page two is its own thing three is its own page and they give you lots of examples that you can just plug and play and then you can also of course they they encourage you, you can make up your own um so <laughs> kenny i made characters we did um we didn't use the character sheet uh we did it for this presentation we we kept it in presentation format so it's it's not that different it's though. really not that different so here is here's our characters kenny do you want to do your character first sure hello my name is dr winkler i am 59 years old and stand six foot one inch tall i am the party's doctor when people see me they first notice my golden scales my vestigial antennae and my gentle disposition. I wear a quilted jacket, oversized spectacles, and move with a joyful whistle. I am from a seastead where my people are known for inventing the future. I believe in compassion, but my vain side can get in my way. I dream of publishing a book that's found in every home. Hello, Dr. Winkler. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Winkler, so you, Winkler. Winkler. I'm sorry, okay? It's not how my mouth works. All right. Uh, so you did a voice. F you. <laughs> I'll do a voice. Hello. <laughs> my name is Fats Rumbuckle, and I'm, I'll never tell, years old and stand four feet 11 inches tall. I'm the party's wizard when people see me they first notice my generous curves heavy brows and thousand yard stare i real quick pause it's very funny to think of this voice in a character with a thousand yard stare yeah, I, know. <laughs> I wear a billowing jumpsuit antique eyeglasses and move <laughs> <laughs> And move with great difficulty. <laughs> I'm from a hidden ward where my people are known for plating, plainly stating their intentions. I believe in heroism, but my foolish side can get in the way. No. I dream of traveling to the stars. <laughs> oh, I had so much fun doing that. That's amazing. One quick thing to point out about both of these characters. These are all made from the suggestions yes. in the book. Correct. Correct. Yep. I love it. So you it. can get up to some wild shenanigans yep. just with the book suggestions. I imagine I imagine Fats Rum Buckles Thousand Years Stare Thousand Yard Stare is like he's that's his default mode. But when he has to like talk to somebody, he goes into Hello. And he becomes very animated. Yes, yeah, yep, exactly. 
Um, well, Dr. Vinkler is a, a fish psychiatrist. I see, I see. And he comes from a, a race of fish people. I see. Well, what does Dr. Winkler car Vinkler carry? Uh, he carries one pocket knife, a cane, and a magic candle. <laughs> Fats, Fats carries, I always have a dagger, staff, brass knuckles, <laughs> and my magic flask that's filled with red Kool-Aid and vodka. Also, items, well, the common items are not in the book, right? Um, no, they, they just give you an idea of what your weapons are supposed to be, and then you pick one useful item, and then they show the useful items that you can pick. Right. And so my magic flask can, right. can hold a never-ending uh, pouring of some sort of spirit, and I chose this horrible drink that my dad used to drink. <laughs> um, and I chose the magic candle, which is a candle that can light itself and put itself out just by my command. Um, it drips wax, which I think is interesting, but doesn't seem to lose any. Hmm. So I have, in my head, I have ideas for this wax. Interesting. Start yeah. a wax business. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so this is something I'm not clear on from the book. Obviously, you can do whatever you want. But does the book ever say you can fill in these Mad Libs with other stuff that's not in yeah. the book? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. They say, here's stuff that you can put in, but feel okay. free to make your own choices. In my in my head, I was like, of course, you can do that. But I just didn't realize oh, yes, or definitely. didn't know if they... A hundred percent. So then... Um, so once we got our character made and we've chosen our items, then it's time to do the ability. So the way that special abilities work, it's so, so good. Oh my it's gosh. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I was having my mind blown. I this. know, I know, me too. So as a wizard or as a doctor, you have several different learning paths available to you. I think each is like there's like six or seven different learning paths themselves. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is, for instance, and they show this in the book, that if you take the ranger's friend path, you have abilities that go left to right. And you have to take the first ability before you could take the second, the third, the fourth, so on and so forth. It goes in order. Yes, it goes in order. When you take them, when you like decide, I want to do friend, and I want to speak with animal, you don't have to then fill that path. You can then go to a different path in the ranger's book or the, their, their role abilities or their, excuse me, their role learning paths. So I could take speak with animal, but then I could go to a different path and choose another one. I can go up, go up that path more. Um, so it gives you nice flexibility, um, but it also, to me, presents you with an interesting choice when you're designing a character. Yes. Do I want to be a, kind of a jack of all trades, have my dip my toes into a bunch of different paths, or do I want to devote a lot of resources and get like a lot towards one path right. at the expense of the others? Right. And I just want to say that this book is. 200 pages long um and pages 30 to 100 are all about roles and abilities so it is a large chunk of the the book is just the on characters. the character roles and and abilities and they're really fun and cool stuff <laughs> they are really cool yes so some abilities have that cost of adventure points we talked about and i like how they show what that would cost like so it's like a little tab with a uh, a black tab with a number in it and you would so this one for instance says three inside that tab so that would cost three ap to use and then some uh, abilities also require you to make a dice roll on top of that and some abilities actually also have like like higher cost for different effect so you could spend right. more ap to get a, a a bigger effect you could invest it right um, and then they also have these abilities. Each role has these legendary abilities. I think yes, maybe two do. or three of them. And yeah. you can only learn them if your adventure provides like that opportunity. So your guide can decide like, and maybe even just the table decide like, when does it make sense for your character to become a legendary ability user of for a wizard or something? Um, right. It's really cool. Anything else you want to say? Be very, it could be very tied to the world. Yes. Uh, I wanted to say, I just wanted to read one of these that really struck me or give a synopsis sure. because it's awesome. And I just want to give the reader a feel for what these legendary abilities are. Yeah, go for it. How creative the abilities are. So this is the Invoker's legendary called Eternity Gate. 
So when you use it, you roll the die, exciting, and it costs seven AP. You project yourself past all realities and glimpse a place outside time and, time and space into the beyond. Here you may seek and find a single truth by posing a question to eternity itself. The guide will give you a fulsome and accurate answer to your question. If you explain why you're asking the question, the guide will do their best to tell you, to give you an answer that satisfies it. So they won't, it's not like a genie giving you the answer. Right. This, this was a true and genuine answer. You must seek fact. You won't find satisfying answers to questions like what is the meaning of life and how true is that? Uh, casting eternity gate is a huge risk. This is where the die roll comes in. If you roll a 20, a, a triumph, you may receive your answer and get another question. 11 to 19, you get your answer. 6 to 10, you receive your information and return to your body after one week. Your mind ages by one year in that one week. Two to five, you fail to receive the information and return to your body after one week. Your mind is racked from wrong turns in your search. You age by 10 years. Choose an additional character flaw. One, catastrophe. Your mind is trapped in the beyond for 100,000 years where you experience an endless search through a maze of other realities. After enduring this ordeal in the beyond, your mortal consciousness fundamentally changes when you return to your body after one week in real time. The ideals and flaws of your previous self have washed away during your incomprehensible exile. Choose a new ideal, a new flaw, and a new dream to reflect deep changes in your personality. So, so intense. That's amazing. I would be hoping to roll a one. That was exactly my note on it. Is like, this is so fun no matter what you roll. Right. Oh, it's so good. Because it's like, I okay. So other podcasts that I'm on, I've talked about it enough, but I've been watching the Marvel Universe mcu movies i'm gonna bring it up here i have to but it just reminds me of like going quantum and ant-man like you just like i went too small i'm gonna be trapped down here forever Whoops, although ant-man and wasp i have some logic bones to pick with you ant-man okay ant-man wasp i don't know right. anyway that's that'll a be our that'll be our show within a show within a show yeah. sidebar show inside a show talk about movies okay no 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 no. okay so it's amazing i love it the they're super fun to choose so we actually chose abilities for our characters as well i'll let uh dr wing winkler go first and i i don't oh want to go into like the heavy what detail yeah yeah of course so um i chose uh pads on the healing path necromancy harm two in perception and one in examination. And I enjoy these two because I'm always already thinking about what my character's story was. And you can think about your paths as informing that. So he came from a place that was like studying like the, the dark arts of medicine. Like they're trying to meddle with the forces of death. And Dr. Winkler wants to heal people by healing their minds. Mm. So he has some of that knowledge of how to harm, but he's more interested in perception and examination. I see. I see. Interesting. So like, I, we also wrote up here for people who are not seeing this, uh, watching this video, and just maybe listening to the podcast. We also put up here what things cost. So, like, right. his Dr. Vinkler's abilities for healing it, mend is mm -hmm. one AP. Uh, Death sense, you can do one, or you have two options, zero or two options for one AP. On the harm path, I took corrupt, which is a zero AP. Very handy. Um, perception, I took modulate, which is one AP. Uh, and also took shape senses one or two AP and then examined the dead under examination for one AP. Makes sense for a doctor. Sure, sure. So for fats abilities, wizards have evocation, conjuration, plane shifting, magecraft, projection, and trickshirt. Yeah, wow. Projection and trickery. Man, that's like a cracker barrel twister. word for me. Yeah. Oof. Projection and trickery. Um, these, so fats is... Um, I play a lot of uh, Silly Wizards. Really? Oh, yeah, really. <laughs> and I really liked the trickery path a lot uh, because it spoke to me as far as a graphic designer and what I do in a, on a daily basis, which is to say I took trickery speak. I talk a lot in my day job, whatever. Uh, but there's also trickery pinch, trickery stretch, trickery undo. Um, there's also a trickery Photoshop I see there. That's interesting. No, there's, no, there's no Photoshop. <laughs> but I really liked those. Uh, I like manipulation uh, and illusion. And I didn't want to be a magician. Uh, I wanted to be able to actually make like true 
cons like true things happen um but each of those if you look at my uh, uh look at it undo you can pay one two three or four ap to up to certain levels of like rewinding something making something not happen um and then uh like speak is one ap pinches two ap stretches two ap two two ap or four ap um then I also took Conjuration Familiar because I wanted to be able to summon a hedgehog for, I don't know, I just wanted that to have for myself. Um, and then I also took Magecraft No, which is like Counterspell, which I like, I love that too. I just like to imagine Fats being like, no, <laughs> not today, Satan. Look uh, at you, embracing counter magic. Whatever. That's great. So I really liked that idea for Fats where he's just like manipulating, crafting the world uh, for fun. I don't know. There's nothing much and profit. Deeper, mu- nothing deeper than that. And also, he has a hedgehog. <laughs> so yeah, I like it. So that's the character stuff. It's really fun. I really enjoyed making the characters. Looking through it's very abilities. evocative. Yeah, it lends itself to good characters without having to put much work. But you can put work into oh, yeah. it to get something really amazing. Definitely. So play that was player stuff, and there is a section for the guide. So now we'll talk a bit about the guide, and I'm kind of just gonna really just brush through this right like i just want to talk high level like this is what they have to offer for the jamming side so um you are the lamp that lights the way uh they really talk about the basics of jamming which is good you know this is a conversation you need to be focusing on the fantastic there is a player safety section which is really nice uh, they talk about boundaries they talk about uh something called a stop sign that's their tool for this game specifically and then they link to other additional resources uh there are really good tools in this game that i'm going to steal to use from other games i run so like for instance building the world there's a worksheet for setting the like the big scene picture of what's going on and what your characters your players are going to be interacting with they mm-hmm. talk a lot about how to run the game clues challenges consequences i really liked this section section i wish i had this section when i first started jamming i i liked it too the only thing for me that again this is like your tiny nitpick stuff they call them clues and they're they're more than just like a clue as to what's happening like in a scene they're hooks they're like, they, they're hooks yeah yeah it's, and it felt like they were really married to their c words in this you section. know what and i don't mind Mwah, i like it it's good all for right me. what i don't like it as much but that's I, that's a small sure small sure, thing. sure um setting they talk about how to set scenes like offering these clues or or providing more to the hook you know be flexible and then they give a lot of good examples of like hooks and clues whatever you want to call them Yep. Um, they talk about rolling the die, like trials. Only roll once, which I thought was very important considering you have 1d20 <laughs> and no modifiers. Um, they talk a lot about NPC rolls and like good examples of, of challenges. Um, they talk about consequences. I'm noticing typos on my screen as I'm writing, as I'm reading out loud. That's okay. Uh, I'm only human after all. Uh, lower, they talk about low risk, higher risks, rewards, setbacks, tough choices, like what to put in front of your players, essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, I liked the section about mercy. It's kind of in theme with their game. Mm -hmm. It's in theme with their game. It makes sense. Yes. Like it's okay to give the players a way out of their system out of their situation especially if it makes the game more fun so this is again, that's the bit that really is like yes, thumbs up for me if it makes the game more fun so winning all the time is not necessarily fun i think it's fun to fail and if you are a player to quest or any rpg for that matter i think it's it's i I challenge you to embrace failure because they can lead to really fun consequences and really great character moments. And I think that's why this is in here where it's like, hey, it's okay to like let your players get out of situations and talk at the table about like what this means narratively. Mm -hmm. Um, But especially if it makes the game more fun. So definitely. Um, They have uh, a section for NPCs, how to craft them and then templates 
Uh, they talk about how combat combat works, rounds and turns. They give a good example of combat. And then they also, which is very important, I think, in a game like this, how to calculate difficulty rating, um, especially since you don't have to think about modifiers um, or anything else. It's like, I was like, how do you scale stuff in this game? How do you make things more or less difficult? Right, because it's like, you stay at 10 HP, but your abilities are getting better. So how do you scale that now? Um, so that's really fu- that's a really good section. Uh, there's a section for the first play. Uh, so the first session together, they talk about managing sessions. There's also advanced rules for things like um, dual roles. So if somebody wants like multi-class essentially, um, that's pretty cool. And then for the rest of the book, like pages 133 through 155 are just treasure. Stuff they can find. So... <laughs> good big part of this book character creation and treasures yes huge chunks um so so yeah that's that's the guide section anything you stood out to you kenny in the guide section uh i think nothing that i haven't already noticed the only the the only thing that i kind of like wrinkled my nose out was mercy but that's just because of my background yeah um consequences matter but i think they had they they give you consequences and follow with mercy I think having both is good. Like there should be consequences to what the players choose to do, but it should end with what's fun. You know, sure. There should be consequences, but that's because consequences can be fun. Yeah. Kenny, this is not a death trap dungeon game. I'm thinking about how to make this one. Oh, it'd be actually pretty fun. Honestly, it would be pretty fun, especially if it's a one shot, man, I would, exactly. I would run fat through some spikes anyway. (laughs) All right. Well, I'll I'll log that away. (laughs) Um, okay, let's move on to uh, our last section of the show, which is about UX and layout. I'm going to let you go first. Okay. And then we've got some visuals, perhaps, yes. that can help out the people watching yep, the video. Yeah, and I'll okay. click on them when you talk about them. Okay. I'm sure we'll overlap in a lot of our thought here. I thought that the order of information was pitch perfect. I thought it went in a completely logical way where everything is just building up more information. And then when I get to character creation, it's like, I'm ready to build a character. I never had a moment where I was like, wait, I need, what is this referring to? Maybe it's, maybe it'll tell me what this means later, which I don't, I really don't like those moments when I'm reading RPG books. So I really didn't get any of those. The pages are really decluttered. They are not busy at all. You get a little bit of art here and there, um, but the focus is on the ideas. And then when they want to give you art, they're used to say, here's the next section of the book. And you get this huge, beautiful splash art, which can immerse you a little bit. Um, What I really love, um, two big things stood out to me, specific things. um, And you can go to the the next slide on this one um, is that they are very good at presenting information and, and giving it to you in a way where they don't have to tell you what they're doing. So, for example, they have uh, this page where they're just telling you uh, that conversation thing that you were talking about. They're trying to get that across that it's a a give and take between the guide and the players. And so on this page, on the left side, you get a column telling you all about that. You get some art as a divider of information down the middle. And on the right-hand side, you get an example of what that would look like. But they don't label that. They don't tell you, here's an example of play, and here's what it might look like. They don't have to. It's completely obvious, and it's separate from the rest of the text. It's smaller. I, I think it tells you, it gives you this information very economically. I agree. And then, and then something you mentioned earlier, you were talking about the different, the cosmology, like the, the omniverse and the beyond and the shadow plane and all that stuff. Another place where they do that is when they're talking about just the simple thing of distances, like in combat, and they give you a little uh, written description of each one. And each comes with, an illustration of an adventurer with a bow and some kind of beast that he seems to be hunting, that they seem to be hunting, that gives you just a quick visual indicator of what they mean by these distances, which again, super economic in terms of the information you're getting versus how much text and how much space it's taking up. Yeah. It's it's great. It's yeah, it is. When I first was going through this book and I was just flipping through it. I, I was basically super inspired. Like this is the kind of instruction manual that I would myself would love to be able to create one day. Um, And a lot of that comes down that first like 
getting to be good with layout is understanding how to organize your information. And I remember looking at that table of contents and just loved how they broke out the table of contents in such a way that it was talking to you, right? And also it was just four categories, which is huge. It's like this book only truly has four real sections. Four sections is a lot more palatable than 15 sections. And it's also more memorable just because of how our brains work. But I really liked how they were like, the contents page doesn't even say contents. It says what's inside. First, we'll teach you how to play the game. And then there's a page numbers of everything. Second, you'll create a unique ba- character with a backstory, a dream, and a role to play. Cool. Uh, third, we'll prepare you. Oh, sorry. Third, you'll prepare your character with special abilities and equipment. And finally, if you're the guide, we'll teach you how to run the game. And it's just so, it's so beautifully done. Oh my god! I'm like, it gave me goosebumps, and I'm, it's such a weird thing to get goosebumps from. But I love good organization. Well, this is your jam. It is such it is such my jam. Yes. One other thing I like about that table of contents: notice that they don't call that one section character creation. Nope. It's framed in a way that if you're a brand new player and you don't know these tropes, yes. you you get what this section is going to be doing. Yep. Um, on top of that, I love the font size they used. I don't think there's a font that goes below 10 point. For the most part, all of their font feels like it's 16 point to 20 point font, which is great for, for people. Um, all people. Yes, all people. Please, yeah. Um, I, I love how, like I said at the beginning, like the facing pages relate to each other so that you just have all the information you need for that particular point on two pages you're looking at right there. You don't have to flip, flip around like what you were saying. Um, and then it's just very, just spacious. It's a very spacious book. I, I think I'm missing out a little bit even. I mean, I'm gushing about it too, but I only have the digital version. Mm-hmm. The physical version, I bet feels even more yes. we spacious, should, we should, luxurious. It's, it's what you're saying. Uh, I was going to bring that up too, is that they have two different layouts. One that's optim- optimized for digital. And then they also have, um, obviously the physical print which i was the one that was using another thing i would like to say is that they said in the beginning of their digital print that you know toss a coin there's like a little thing that says toss a coin to your you toss a coin because they said we don't mind how you got this pdf but please consider doing as we want people to if play. you like it if you like it yeah whatever i thought that was really nice yeah um, definitely so so going back to that spaciousness I, I think sometimes there's this there's this natural inclination to fill up as pages with as many as you can so you can have less pages um, because for some reason less pages means less overwhelming. Um, and that's not the case at all. Like this book was 200 pages and it didn't feel tiresome at all. Right. Um, and it's because if if you start to like shrink stuff down and begin to fill pages with things too many things that spaciousness that goes away your brain starts to get cluttered with information um i bet they could have if they really wanted to gotten this book down to 100 pages they could have cut in half um, but you would have lost out on really beautiful art that reinforces one learning uh to tone and like the mood of the game um and it would it, it it would just be visual clutter You're visually cluttered which is not good for for brains for how we process information um again going back to font choices great font choice easy to read the space between the lines was great the art was beautiful um i'm very uh layout conscious i really don't like justified text in books i think sometimes it can be done okay and it works but a lot of times it can be um hard on the eyes because it doesn't give a lot of um, movement, variation. variation. Um, so I liked that all their text was ragged right or um, left aligned. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, for me, I mean, I put so many post-it notes. Like nobody, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see, but I've gotten so many post-it notes in this thing. Um, I just, I just, just random stuff like, I love that they bolded keywords. Um, I love that they had bullet point lists. And I love that they had page references next to stuff. So it's like, oh, your character profile is on page 31. Uh, the character worksheet is on page 32. Um, 
I was noticing things that they had the the um, on the physical print, they had the page numbers twenty two and twenty three were on the same page on the on the top right. That was an interesting choice. I I had not seen that before. Um, yeah, I did notice that in the the digital version as well. Yeah, um, didn't bother me, but. So yeah, there's just a lot of good little stuff. I love how they show you, like what the, I showed in the presentation, what AP looks like. You know, they, mm -hmm. they count, call that out. Um, but yeah, it's just a really good. Yeah. I liked that in the same thing, they're like, sometimes the abilities will say, roll, you, will ask you to roll the dice. It'll come with a tag that looks like this. Yeah. Black box, roll the die. Like, couldn't be clearer. And I love it. I love, I mean, it's, it's good. So anyway, great. I love it yeah it's fantastic yep so yeah so with that i mean that's our first tabletop spotlight do we do we how do we give a grade do we just we, is it thumbs up thumbs, thumbs down up, thumbs down waffle hands um i mean this is easy for us on this one right right just like, like thumbs up like we're into boom. it go check it out i i after reading this i want to play i want to run this game or playing it wink wink Wink, yeah, wink. yeah, 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 yeah. Wink, 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 wink. Um, so yeah, so I think it's. I said it was like the Adventurers Guild is where it's published. It's called Quest. Uh, you Google it. You could do Quest RPG because if you just do Quest, it's probably not going to show up. Um, but yeah, I, I really love it. It's good. It's fantastic. You can also also go to uh, www.adventure.game. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, I'm terrible at ending things. <laughs> I don't know how to end the show. I'm going to do it by doing this. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we're, we plan on doing this every four-ish interviews. Uh, Tabletop Spotlight will come out. Um, we would love to hear your suggestions. Is there, yes, please. Is there a book that you have that or that you've wanted to read but haven't gotten to or that you are interested in? Um, I am more than happy to buy books too uh, especially if it's indie creators i would like to give back to the indie community as well so any and all i will take um and i'll ask for stuff on our twitter i don't plug it enough tabletop babble has a twitter it's at tabletop babble um that's where i'll probably post things that's where you can send me stuff uh be great just tweet at me tweet at me bro uh, and then also, if you want to follow me personally uh, online, where I do graphic design and draw goblins and do a million other things for Geekspective, that's at Rocket Orca. That's me, Kenny. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Wolfmir. If you're interested in RPGs and MTGs, MTGs being Magic the Gatherings. Yeah, mostly what I care about on Twitter. <laughs> yep. And uh, so, yeah, look forward to doing this next time. I enjoyed making this giant. That was really fun. Point. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to do the next one. I think I'm going to drop it here. Uh, I think the next one's going to be Blades in the Dark because that was requested. Okay. Okay. I will. I will come in as the novice. You can come in as the. I've played it. I'm not house running. expert. <laughs> All right. Uh, until next time, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and bye! Bye-bye!